Hi everyone, I'm Andrew Crotty. I'm just starting as an assistant professor of computer science at Northwestern, and the title of my talk is Everyone Should Use Apache Arrow for Data Systems Research. And by everyone, I'm mainly talking about people who do systems research work in academia like me, but this could apply equally well to anyone who needs to build system prototypes to test out different ideas. Now, they're not paying me to say this yet, this is just based on my own experience doing systems research in academia and working with the Arrow ecosystem. So my research focuses on the design of systems for large-scale data analytics. The systems that I build allow data scientists and domain experts to analyze and extract value from massive data sets. And this is becoming increasingly important as people in all types of fields, whether it's business or medicine or public policy, are trying to make better, more data-driven decisions. I love what I do. I get to work on some really interesting problems, but there's just one big issue. It takes a really long time. To be more concrete, you know, the conventional wisdom is that it takes about 10 years of effort, so 10 person years of work, to build a fully functional feature complete system. If we visualize this on a timeline here, if I start today in 2022 and work full time on building a new system, I can expect to finish it 10 years from now, in 2032. Seems like kind of a long time, you know, a lot can change in the interim, but there's an even more pressing issue. My tenure clock is only six years long, and I need something to show for it. So what this means is that I need to figure out how to pack about 10 years worth of effort into just six years. I guess I can work nights, weekends, holidays. I can tell my wife, uh, you know, we can't take any vacations for the next six years. I'm not sure how well that's going to go over, but even with all that, it's just not going to be enough. Even worse, I can't spend 100% of my time working on my system anyway. My job has a lot of other responsibilities. I have to teach classes, serve on committees, write grants, all kinds of different stuff. And let's say that optimistically, I can spend about 30% of my time uninterrupted just building the system. So that comes out to roughly two years worth of work before my tenure review. So where am I gonna get the other eight person years? Well. Of course, I can hire a PhD student to work with me, but they can't work 100% of the time either. They have to take classes, write a dissertation, play foosball, all the other stuff that students have to do. So let's estimate the same 30% allocation, which is another two person years. So this is good if I hire, you know, four students uh, for six years, plus me, we're up to the, the 10 person years worth of effort. And we've finished building a new system before I go up for tenure. There's a catch, though, which is that the university pays my salary, but I have to pay for the students. So between a stipend, benefits, tuition, and everything else, each student costs about $100,000 per year. Now, if we do all the math, that's four students times six years times $100,000 each, which comes out to a total of $2.4 million. Now, I'm a new faculty member. I don't have any money for my research group. Maybe when Voltron IPOs in a few years, I can get to the front of the line for some academic research grants. But until then, you know, this would be a huge investment to get everything accomplished in such uh, a really a short time frame. And that's assuming everything goes perfectly according to plan. There are no issues or delays or anything like that. So I started wondering if there was some way I could speed up this process by skipping a lot of the aspects of system building that are you know, important, but ultimately don't really add to the final research contribution. And this is where Arrow comes into play. So in the rest of the talk, I want to tell you about a recent project where we're starting to test out different research ideas we have by building a lean prototype based on Apache Arrow. So this story, uh, you could call it a research vignette, begins in 2017. Uh, we just started a project looking at large-scale time series workloads, and we were trying to get our hands on a large real-world data set. But as anyone who has ever tried to get access to real-world data sets knows, nobody's willing to share. So we decided we were just going to collect our own data uh, about a bunch of IoT sensors, and we went around the computer science building at Brown, where I got my PhD, setting them up. Uh, which we had to do in the middle of the night so we didn't disrupt classes or anything. And unfortunately, I didn't realize I'd need to climb around changing batteries for the next 18 months. So eventually I, I just stopped going to the gym and did this for exercise instead. But the project went well. Uh, we collected a whole bunch of data and then we wanted to analyze it. So imagine this is some sensor data and X is the timestamp when an event took place, maybe a door being opened or a motion sensor triggering in a room. 
Now you want to execute a query over it, like the SQL query here, to get the count of events that took place after some timestamp, for example, 567. Alternatively, for my friends out there who prefer data frame syntax, I have the equivalent pandas version right below here. So of course, uh, the easiest thing to do would be just a big sequential scan over all the data, but since you'll have to look at every single element, it's going to get pretty slow as the data set grows over time. If you notice the data is sorted, as it is here, you could do something smarter, like binary search, which, of course, has log n time complexity. Alternatively, if you're willing to pay some upfront cost and don't mind added space overhead, uh, for example, if you're going to be querying this a lot, you could build an auxiliary data structure like a B-tree index to get even faster lookups. So these two approaches are completely generic and they'll work the same on any data set. But one interesting thing about real world data is that there are all sorts of inherent patterns. For example, more people are using the building during weekdays and on the weekend. Uh, it's very active during the daytime, but in the middle of the night, only the grad students are there, that sort of stuff. So there was a paper a few years ago that proposed something called learned indexes that use machine learning models to identify and leverage these patterns in the data. Some of you may have heard of them. Uh, they're sort of a fad right now. Basically, to do a lookup, you feed the value you're looking for, uh, in the example it's 567, into the model, and it gives you back a bounded search range where you'll find that value in the sorted data. There are a whole bunch of blog posts and forum discussions about learned indexes, and they all repeat this idea here that learned indexes should be able to outperform traditional data structures because they can adapt to the underlying data distribution. And while this might play some part in the performance improvement, I believe that it actually comes down to several implicit assumptions baked into the design of learned indexes that alternative approaches don't consider. The three big ones are that the data needs to be stored in a densely packed sorted array, has a fixed range, so fixed minimum and maximum values, and is read-only, so it can't be updated in place. Of course, indexes like the B-tree make none of these same assumptions. So I wondered what would happen if we designed a traditional data structure, so without any of the machine learning stuff, that incorporates all of these same assumptions, and whether that would allow us to get performance similar to or even better than learned indexes. So the data structure I came up with is called the history, short for histogram tree, where each node is essentially a histogram that partitions the data into progressively smaller subranges. So there are two things we need to decide up front, uh, the number of bins in each histogram and the maximum size of the bounded search range at the end, chosen here as 4 and 16. So the root of the tree splits the range up into equal with bins, 0 to 256, 256 to 512, and so on. And the number in each bin signifies the count of values that fall within that range. So for example, there are 20 values in the array that are between 0 and 256. Here, uh, the fourth bin only has 13 elements, which is below our leaf threshold of 16, so we don't need to expand it further. The other three bins get further partitioned in the next layer, so 0 to 64, 64 to 128, and so on. And then we need one more layer to get all the bins below that leaf threshold of 16. And this is the full history built over this data set. Now, to understand how we can perform lookups using the history, let's walk through step-by-step step the same example with the value of 567. We start at the root node by calculating that 567 belongs in the third bin, and then we perform a sequential scan adding up all the counts to the left of that bin. So 20 plus 94 is 114. Then we do the same thing at the third bin's child, and then one last time at the leaf. So if we add up 114 plus 0 plus 15, we get 129, which tells us the starting point of the bounded search range in the array, where we'll find the value 567. So this is the simplified 10,000 foot view, and there are lots more optimizations that go into making lookups faster and lowering index construction time and compressing the data structure, all that good stuff. So if you're interested, please check out the paper from uh, the CIDR 2021 conference for more information. Now, taking a look at performance, we have the index size in megabytes on the x-axis, uh, note the log scale, and lookup time per key measured in nanoseconds on the y-axis. And here we'll show the results using a, a data set from a recent paper about learned indexes. It's OpenStreetMap data that consists of 200 million latitude-longitude pairs. As a baseline, we have binary search, which is a flat line at just over 300 nanoseconds because there's no associated space overhead. Then there's the B-tree, which is faster than binary search, but you can also trade off index size with the size of the bounded search range at the end. So the B-tree lookup performance is best somewhere at the intermediate sizes, so not the largest and not the smallest. 
Next is the learned index, which we can make very small, but it also has comparatively poor lookup performance at this small size. But if we increase the model size to make it more accurate, it can outperform the B-tree by almost 2x at the largest size. And finally, uh, we have the history, which is both faster and smaller than the learned index. Depending on which way you want to look at it, it's either two times faster at the largest size or over 100 times smaller at comparable lookup latencies. So uh, these are some pretty promising initial results on a series of micro benchmarks, but the next step is really to see how much history can improve performance in a more realistic setting. So I currently have a team of students working to integrate the history code into Arrow's streaming execution engine so we can evaluate it in the context of OLAP workloads. Now, thinking a bit broader, I believe that Arrow is opening up a lot of opportunities for impact in this space. Previously, all the different analytics frameworks out there, uh, these are just a few shown here, used to be monoliths. The API and execution engine and storage layer would all be tightly coupled and nothing was interoperable. But more recently, there's been a trend towards these open source data storage formats like Arrow that allow all these different systems to share data in a standard way. And this is becoming increasingly popular both in open source and commercial systems. The opportunity here for researchers is that Arrow provides a great foundation on which to build lean prototypes to quickly evaluate many different research ideas while still within the context of a real system whether it's new indexes or filtering data structures or higher level SQL operators. And if they work, now suddenly all these different frameworks can benefit because they all interoperate with Arrow. And I believe that this is really the secret sauce that's going to allow me and my research group to hopefully have a lot of impact in the relatively short time frame before my tenure clock runs out. So with that, thanks for listening. And if you're interested in learning more about the work we're doing or are considering applying to computer science PhD programs, Definitely check out the Northwestern CS Department website at the link shown here. Thanks again.